Hello and welcome back. This is the last lecture that is covering new material that will be on the AP test, uh, which we have in about four weeks, uh, in one month, and one day exactly. So the 22nd of May. Uh, so this is really not anything new. If yesterday's video was a lot longer. Today I'm just going to do more examples, uh, pretty much doing the the uh, two two examples from from the assignment as well. So uh, the question we have today that we're going to answer is on average, how much older are husbands than the wives? So generally, you've probably noticed that the husbands are typically older than their wives, but how much older? How many years uh, would the average difference between husbands and wives? So these are paired samples because each husband wife is a pair. So we're not just taking the average age of married men and the average age of married women those samples would be too varied between the overall ages but because they're paired together uh, so for instance my parents i think are three and a half years apart so my dad is three and a half years older than my mom um, he will always be three and a half years older than my mom because that's how time works so we can remove all the variation from just general older couples and younger couples by subtracting the difference between each pair of, of spouses. So that's, that's the idea of what we're getting into today. So there was a recent British survey uh, was, that asked 200 uh, couples, on average, how much older uh, they asked the husband's age and the wife's age. I suppose she would give it uh, anyway. Um, and then they, they found the difference between, as we can see here, so we have the wife's age, the husband's age, the difference between the husband minus the wife. The reason they put the husband's age before the wife's age is because they wanted to make sure, they, they assumed that, or they were expecting that the husbands would be older and they wanted to make the differences positive. So we usually put the bigger values before um, the, the second set of values that we think would be uh, smaller or less in this case. And sure enough, if we look at the histogram for the differences between husband and wife's ages uh, for each uh, married couple, uh, if you notice the, the, the mode and the mean here looks like it's going to be very close to two years, uh, which is in a positive direction, which means that they, on average, uh, the average difference between the husband and wife pairs was a two-year age difference. Uh, of course, there are some outliers. There were some husbands that were 20 years older, it looks like, or whatever that uh, bin group is. It looks like that's uh, so from, yeah, four years, so two-year group. So anywhere from um, from 20 to 21, uh, just under 22 years difference. There was one out of the 200 couples that were sampled. But there were also some uh, some cougars going on here. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I don't know any other way to say it, but apparently... Uh, she was uh, anywhere from 12 uh, to 8 years older. And there's quite a few in that group too. So, you know, these these sort of things happen. Uh, I couldn't not have fun with this. There were three outliers. I don't know who she is, but um, that's the guy from the Call of the Wild. No, it's Indiana Jones. Anyway, so... Um, assumptions and conditions on this one. First, we are doing paired data. So it's always preferable to design an experiment where we can... Uh, pair data or block data together if it's an observation. Um, and so we want to be able to pair it. And when we are able to subtract the differences between the two and the paired data, it removes all the extra variation that we would have um, from just two random samples of married men and married women. Uh, and if we found the difference between those ages, it would not be nearly as conclusive. We would probably still see um, a positive uh, difference where the, the husbands are generally older than the wives. But if we didn't pair them up, then we would have a lot of extra variation in just the ages of people that we sampled in general. So anyway, it's always beneficial to pair the data and to be able to subtract this. It gives us much more conclusive results with a smaller sample size because we can remove a lot of variation. But in this case, the data is paired because they are couples. So we're good um, because each husband is related to their wife because they're married. And that's exactly what we were asking. Next, uh, independence. So are the samples independent? So um, each couple is independent of the next couple, but of course the husband is age is not going to be independent of the wife's age, right? Because uh, of course an an older couple typically is you know if the husband is older then then the wife would typically be older as well because they were an old, older couple, right? That probably got married when they were younger, but you know, think of your grandparents, right? So the two groups don't have to be independent. It's each 
individual pair that has to be independent of the next pair. So that's a little bit different, um, and but I, hopefully you get that. Randomization, so were they a random sample? Do we expect them to be representative? That's the real question. So they were randomly sampled. I guess they're British couples or something like that um, where they did the sample, so we're expecting them to be representative of all couples. Uh, nearly normal. So if we look at the histogram of the differences, it looks like it comes from a normal uh, population. So if we look, took all the British uh, couples, would they all that would that population also be nearly normal or normally distributed? Yeah, probably so. But even if they were skewed by these outliers, so our standard deviation might be larger than what we would normally say if we didn't have these outliers of uh, Indiana Jones and the, the cougars over here. I need, there, there should be, is there a word for like male cougars? Not pet, no, not, uh, I'm not even going to finish the word. That's terrible. Uh, you guys are so much fun. Uh, or the fact that it's really late at night when I'm recording this and I apparently think I'm funny today. All right. So anyway, nearly normal. Um, so did our sample show us that we think the population itself was normal? And even if it wasn't, the central limit theorem would kick in with a sample size of 200 and we would definitely work. Remember even the CEO data when we were taking average uh, CEO compensations, uh, even though that data was incredibly skewed, it still gave us a, uh, a sampling distribution model that was a really well approximated by a normal curve when we took sample sizes of 200 from those 500 CEOs. So uh, we're definitely good. We probably could even skip this one altogether because our central limit theorem is going to really take care of it. But that's okay. We'll go ahead and write it. Our histogram for the differences is unimodal and symmetric. So we believe that the population itself was a normal, normally distributed. All right. So here's uh, here's our sample, right? From our sample, we had a standard deviation of 4.1 with a, a, a mean difference of two and a half years. Uh, to find the sampling dis uh, standard error for the sampling distribution model, uh, I guess it wasn't 200, it was 170. What did I say before there? Oh, I said 200. Uh, I'm not sure which one it is. I guess we're going to go with 170. All right, so from a sample, still with a hundred with a sample size of 170, central limit theorem is still going to do the same thing. So it's not going to be much of a difference. Um, and there's a law of diminishing returns. So uh, when we divide by the square root of 170, it's not going to be that different than if we did 200. So uh, that should make sense. Anyway, uh, doing the math, we get a sampling distribution model uh, with a standard with a uh, sample size of 170 so and these are all the possible uh, pairs uh, or average differences we could see between uh, between sample sizes of 170 couples uh, centered we suspect at the that well our sample is the best thing we have for it with the standard deviation of 0.31 notice the standard deviation is pretty low because of such a large sample size all right are the differences we found based on sampling variation so we found an average difference of two and a half uh, where the sampling distribution model standard error was uh, 0.31. So how far away is zero from that value? Uh, really a lot of standard deviations, which is going to be a very low p-value. So let's write our hypothesis. The delta naught is the hypothesized difference. That's what we use here. We're going to assume that there was no difference between the husband and wife's ages, that they're not related to each other, so that the the uh, the average, which is the mu, right? So the mean difference is going to be equal to zero. The alternative, we're going to do a two-sided test. We're probably pretty sure it's going to be the husbands that are older than the wives but you know those cougars could skew there are lots of them out there anyway um so um we're just going to do a two-sided test uh if you want to do one side test i totally understand we would we would say that it would be greater than zero um meaning that the husband's age would be larger than the average wife age or the the husbands on average would be older than their wives all right so our observed mean difference was 22, or sorry, 2.2 years with the standard deviation from the population, standard error from our sampling distribution model of 31. So ours was, ooh, wow. So how many of these standard deviations do we have to go over? Apparently like seven of them. Uh, and if we go to seven with our degrees of freedom of 169, again, there's not two samples, so we don't have to do the funky uh, formula from the calculator that the, the calculator does for us because we're not dealing with the uh, Pythagorean theorem of statistics from two random independent samples and events going on. Uh, when we do this, we put it in the calculator, we'll get a p-value that is really, really small. I guess I'll go ahead and show you how to do that. So we're going to go to stat test. And again, we're not doing a two sample t-test. 
we're doing just the regular t-test because we we don't have two samples we have one sample because we subtracted the two uh, paired data together so we're just dealing with one list of data which is the difference between each couple's ages so it's a t-test uh, we're going to put in the stats we're hypothesizing the difference was nothing uh, with a average of two and a half or 2.2 years and a standard deviation of 4.1 and a sample size of 170 uh, we're going to do a two-sided test. If not, it would make sense that we would say that it would be larger than zero uh, because we were thinking husbands were going to be older. Anyway, hit calculate. Notice our p-value is 5.8 times 10 to the negative 11th power, meaning there are 10 zeros in front of that. So it would be 0 .0000, 10 zeros. Then you get to your 5 and your, your 8. So that is, uh, if we put this in a if we had a statistical package or software that was was cranking these numbers out for us, it would just simply summarize that the p-value was less than uh, 0 0.001, which is practically zero for, or statistically zero for our, our purposes, and it'd be less than any reasonable alpha level. So this would be statistically significant evidence to be able to reject uh, reject our null hypothesis. So it's not likely that this occurred by random sampling variation and that we do not believe um, that the the average age difference between all all uh, husbands and wives in in the UK at least would be zero. Uh, it's actually interesting because the differences between ages uh, between husbands and wives varies by country, um, which is interesting. If you want to look into it, there are some countries where the age difference is very drastic. Uh, and there, are, ooh, I want to say a country's name so bad, but I'm not going to. I know, so controversial. Um, and then there are others where it's not so different between the two. But I think uh, the U.S. follows the U.K. Um, and and our our values are pretty close to theirs, um, the statistical value. Anyway, all right, so if there was no difference, that is what the p-value is calculating off. So if there was no difference and the, the true uh, difference is zero, then the probability of getting a sample size of like 2 point whatever that was, 2 point... Uh, yeah, 2.2, which is about seven standard deviations out, would be the probability of that occurring, again, looking at this, is pretty much zero. And that's why we would say just less than 0 0.001. Um, and notice here the degrees of freedom I'm doing infinite, in infinite, right? Which is just the normal model. Normally I would drag one at hat normally. Normally I drag out one, which would have degrees of freedom 169. But keep in mind, once we get sample sizes of means larger than 30, it gets really really close to the actual uh, bell curve in the first place and as we approach infinity it is the bell curve uh, so anyway it, if i did show they would vary they would just shift so slightly you wouldn't even be able to tell so anyway just thought i'd tell you that so what is the actual true difference so we're assuming that this value is not zero okay the, at least in the united kingdom there is a difference between husbands and, and wives ages the, the men tend to be older. So what is that true value? So this is no longer the case. Now there is something else. Let's say the average age is one year. So the the true average, if we did a census and, you know, we just, I just filled out data for the census uh, here um, in America. So if, if the average age difference was one year, then with these kinds of a sample size, what would the power of our test be? So whatever we set our alpha level to really matters, right? Those two are related to each other, the false positive and the false negative rates. So uh, we default to a 5%. If we wanted a stricter standard of proof of 1%, where only 1% of the time we would get a false positive saying there was a difference when there wasn't, then that would decrease the power of our test like so. If we added um, a sloppier, allowed for a sloppier false positive to allow for a more sensitive test, which is kind of what people excuse me, are talking about right now, with all the various different COVID testing, if we allow for a sloppy or false positive so that we catch more people and have a more sensitive test, um, we'd have less false negatives, but then we have more false positives and you know different, different things going on there anyway. All right, so let's stick with a default alpha level of 5%. It still would be fairly powerful with this such large sample size for us to be able to detect that difference. It looks like about 90% of the time we'd be able to detect the difference and be able to correctly reject the null hypothesis, which would be uh, the truth is that we reject the null, which is okay. Yeah. So if, if H not was false. All right. So what if the actual true difference was about two years? <laughs> okay. So on this one, look at the power of the test. Even if with the strictest standard of 1%, we still looks like, mm, well, 
I don't want to say 100% of the time we'd be able to detect that difference, but not with this population and the sample size, but 99.99, you know what I'm saying, percent of the time we would be able to detect that because of a large sample size. So beautiful graphics, loving what's going on here. Hopefully you guys understand it. Next thing, now that we said that there is a difference and we were able to reject the null hypothesis, next question that logically follows is what do we believe that difference to be? Well, we know we would center it, our confidence interval, at our our samples difference because that's the best amount of data that that's you know from our sample that's the best uh that's the closest that we would be able to get to right so we're going to center it there but we don't think it's exactly 2.2 years um at least not with any certain amount of of confidence we could say that so uh we would take our our t star which is our critical value which came from the inverse t model uh, it's really close to 1.96 because remember uh, as our degrees of freedom increase and sample size increase to infinity, it is the normal model. So it's going to be close, of course, with 95% confidence, really close to the 1.96, uh, which is what we typically use. Alrighty, so next thing we multiply by our standard error, which was 0 0.31, which gives us a confidence interval. Boom, that thing right there. How do we find this by putting it in the calculator? Because no one does that stuff by hand. Uh, we just go to stat, we're going to go to test. Remember, uh, we're doing an interval, but it's not a two sample T interval. It's just a T interval because we only have one sample because we took the difference between them. Again, that's the whole benefit of having paired data is that we're not dealing with two random events, random and independent events. We're dealing with one random event, which is the paired difference between the two couples, ages. All right, so that's that, that's that. Fine, good to go. Alrighty, boom, that's exactly the same information I just got. Okay, cool. So that's how you'd find that. And just make sure you know how to interpret that. So we are 95% confidence that the true, uh, the true mean difference between husbands and wives ages in the United Kingdom, again, because we don't want to extrapolate outside of what we sampled in, right, is going to be anywhere between 1.58 uh, years and 2.8 years older for the husband. All right, our conclusions, because our p-value is less than 0 0.001, which is practically zero, uh, much more statistically significant than any reasonable alpha level that we would choose. Um, we can confidently reject the, the null hypothesis in, in favor of the alternative, which is that there is a difference. Uh, even if we did one-sided test, that would actually cut the p-value in half, which we would, we would still be able to say that there was a difference uh, in saying that the husband's age were, were greater than the wise age in the United Kingdom. Our average difference was two and a half, so we centered our confidence interval about that, and we said that because we know it's not going to be exactly 2.2. Uh, so we were able to say with 95% confidence, well, our, our plus and minus our margin of error, that we believe it's somewhere between 1.6 and 2.8 uh, years older. All right, so that was it, only 18 minutes because I didn't have to explain everything again. So paired data and blocks with observations are really nice. It removes a lot of extra variation, which is what we want to do if we can. But be careful, Don't just because we have two sample sizes. Uh, so if I, if I choose uh, the, if I want to know the average difference between, um, let's say, male and female uh, heights at Putnam City High School. If I take 50 males and 50 females, just because the the sample sizes are the same doesn't mean that I can subtract and pair up each uh, like the first male I sampled and the first female I can't just subtract those two uh, just because they have the same sample size so you have to defend your ability to pair up the data so they have to be related in some way uh, like before and after or or husbands and wives or uh, or it's the same group of people or the same Arshire cows as we saw yesterday or something like that that was fun to say, our Shire cows. All right, so um, anyway, paired data assumption. Um, many drivers of cars that run on regular gasoline actually buy premium in belief that they will get better gas mileage. So higher octane should give you better gas mileage. Um, higher horsepower, so you use less gas is the whole thought. All right, so uh, to test the belief, we use 10 cars from a company fleet, which all the cars run on regular gas. Each car is filled with the first with either regular or premium, decide by a coin toss. So there's some randomization going on there. Uh, so if people drove differently the second time than the first, it would be accounted for. Um, and we wouldn't have any lurking variable in that case. So this is an experiment, and we're randomly assigning treatment groups is what's going on. And the mileage uh, for that tank full is recorded, and the mileage is recorded again, the same car as the tank full for the other kind of gasoline. We don't let the drivers know about the experiments, so we don't tell them the random assignment. So a single blind, naturally, here are the results. Got it. 
All right, so pair data, it is the same driver um, and the same car. And uh, the only thing that's different is the treatment group of gasoline, premium or regular. So it is paired data. As long as we're using the same driver in the same car, we should, their driving style should be the same. Okay. It's not like we just took 10 random drivers with 10 random cars and then 10 for the other group as well. So we can remove that extra variation by pairing it. So this is before and after, in other words, independent assumption. So the drivers are going to be independent of the, the way that the next driver drives, but the, the before and after for the same driver is not independent, obviously, uh, because they're going to drive very similar. So a mile per gallon for one car driver pair will not affect the other one, essentially what we're saying. Uh, randomization condition, they were randomly assigned treatment groups. So um, also, I guess they're saying it was a convenient sample, so we should be careful not to extrapolate to other types of or ages of vehicles. Okay, so that's true. They were all the same type of vehicle, it was a Crown Vic or something like that. So we need to be careful because this might not be true for a different make and model or, or age or something like that. All right, nearly normal. They didn't tell us the data. Uh, sample size is 10, so it's probably large enough. I wouldn't expect it to be so far skewed that a sample size of 10 with a central limit theorem wouldn't kick in. Uh, so we should be fine, even though they didn't show us the actual data. Did they say it was roughly unimodal and symmetric? Oh, okay, so they actually think in number 30, they give you the data. I um, just didn't show it. So we would need to put that in the calculator and check the histogram. So let me see on the next slide. Okay, yeah, so let me go ahead and put that in the calculator. So let me go to stat edit, and I'm gonna put it in list three and list four, because I'm using list one and two for something else. So list three and list four, so, oh no, that's exactly what this is. So regular gasoline went in list one, premium gasoline went in list two. Now remember, we're pairing this up. It's the same driver and car pair for each one of these, so I can subtract the differences. Uh, the next question is, what order do you subtract? Well, which one do you think is going to have a higher uh, miles per gallon? List two, right? The premium one. So I'm going to quit out of this. And I'm going to do list two. So second two. Try that again. So second two. So list two minus list one. And I'm going to stow it as list three. Okay. All right, so these are the pair differences between there. If I go to stat edit, you can see it here. So we did uh, 19 minus 16, which is positive three, two, three. Okay, notice most of these are positive. So that's kind of showing right off the bat, we already have some evidence that we believe that they're, um, they are getting better fuel economy with premium gasoline. All right, so that's good to know. Next question, is there evidence that cars get significantly better fuel economy? So not just is there evidence, is, it, is this evidence significant? Well, to do that, we have to run a test. So test, again, this is not two separate uh, independent samples with variation in each one. No, because we are able to pair it together. Um, then we would be running a t-test in this case. We have the actual data, so we'll just give them the data uh, the data is in list three. Our hypothesized difference would be zero. Frequency is one because it's not a frequency list. And we're just going to assume, is it different? Mm. Scratch that, excuse me. So does is there evidence that premium gets significantly better? So we would be saying that it would be positive. So is it greater than zero? So it's a one-sided test. Because we're spending more money on premium, we wouldn't be interested in saying if premium got worse fuel economy. So it's only a one side test, it makes sense. Uh, T value says we're four, four and a half standard deviations above the mean, which is statistically you know significant, of course. Uh, let's see, P value is very large or very small. There's three zeros in front of that. So it'd be 0 .0007. Uh, so that's definitely less than 1%. Less, so it would be statistically significant for any reasonable alpha level. Uh, the mean difference that we found from our samples was two. So they, on average, they got two miles per gallon better with the premium, which we probably want to change that to percentage. That would be, more, that would, you know, make more sense because, um, yeah, anyway, you want to know what percent better fuel economy, unless you're doing price per gallon, then, you know, you do something different there. Uh, standard deviation from our sample, good, sample size 10. Okay, so is there evidence that the cars get significantly better? Yes, that is statistically significant because it's greater or less than 1%. So if with our p-value less than 1%, yes, that is statistically significant. We have enough evidence to reject the null. 
So create a 95, a 90% confidence interval. So now that we said there was a difference, what do we think the difference is in between what two values, what range of values? So do a T interval. We still have the data. We're going to do 90%. Calculate. Boom. All right. So we think, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what's going on here. Yep. So we think that the average difference between uh, premium uh, miles per gallon and regular is anywhere between 1.2 and 2.8 miles per gallon improved when you run premium. Even if the difference is significant, which this was significant because zero is not contained in it. So with the 90% confidence level, that's 5% on one side. So it would be with an alpha level 5% false positives, right? We would still be fine. Um, and with our p-value definitely less than 5%, we would have rejected it anyway. You can do either one. Uh, even if the difference is significant, why might the company choose to stick with regular gasoline? Well, first is always cost, right? So even though we have improved miles per, miles per gallon, it might not outweigh the cost. So we might get 20% uh, better fuel economy, but premium gas cost, uh, it costs like 40 cents more per gallon. And since <laughs> gas is so cheap right now, um, it might not be worth that. That might be a 50% increase in cost with only a 20% increase in fuel economy. So obviously, um, usually we're, we're interested in the cost, right? Also, cars aren't designed to run on premium, so you might have issues if, you, if you're only supposed to run 87 octane. All right, suppose you had done the bad thing, which sure you didn't. Suppose you would mistakenly treat the two as two these data as two independent samples. So not pairing them together because it's not the same uh, car and driver, just just two random samples uh, or, or two random samples, two different drivers or something like that driving at the same time. Maybe husband and wife pairs. That would be interesting uh, instead of matched pairs. So would this, this, what would the significance test have found? So now we haven't been able to remove the extra variability because we were able to pair them. And so now we're using the uh, Pythagorean theorem of statistics. And so there's more variability going on there. Our sampling distribution model is going to look different because we have less degrees of freedom, uh, because that's going to be, uh, not quite as much degrees of freedom as nine that we would have before would be less than that. So lots of things are changing here. What would the test have, be, have found? So this is actually gonna be pretty easy to, to do in the calculator. So let me go to stat. We're going to do a test, except now we're doing them as two sample T test where our samples are in list one, list two frequencies, all the same. Uh, we're going to hypothesize that list one is less than list two. We, okay. So list two is greater, um, pulling. So the question with pulling is with, um, with, uh, with means we can only pull if it, if it is going to, if it satisfies the equal variance, um, condition. So do we believe that each one of them is equal variance? They probably are, but if they're not, um, then, well, even if they were, it's not going to benefit us very much. So it's safer just to not pull. And so typically we don't pull when it comes to means with proportions, we pretty much always pull and it's never wrong to pull with proportions because they're tied to the binomial model. And so of course they have to have, um, we don't have to worry about that stuff. Okay. So calculate. Hmm. So now we are one point, uh, looking at T value, 1.2 standard deviation below the mean, which is a P value of only 11%, huh? So we went from having a P value of less than 0.001%, which would always be statistically significant to only having a P value of 11%, which would not be enough unless we chose a really sloppy alpha more than 10%, which we never do, even though there are um, tests that we use with false positives more than 10%, you know, remember the whole, uh, meth situation on the playground, which I'm not going to rehash that, but, um, yeah, kind of nasty stuff going on there, uh, ruining people's lives anyway. So, um, in this case, because we're not out able to remove that extra variation, you would, you see here, we would not have had enough evidence to be able to, at least with the sample size, um, and, and the effect size, of course, to be able to, um, to reject the null hypothesis and say that there was an improvement uh, statistically significant improvement by using premium. All right, so explain why the results are so different. So the p-value was 11%, that's what we just got, but we didn't match the data to reduce the car-to-car -car driver-driver variability. And so that's that's what's going on here. Uh, so when we can match it and we can defend that is paired data assumption or match data, then we always wanna do it because it, it gives us much more powerful results. 
All right, look at number six. Eh, we're 30 minutes in. I'm just going to go go through it. It's I already got loaded. So anyway, uh, freshman 15. So some of you seniors, this will be exciting. I, I gained my freshman 15, but it took me from my freshman year of high school to my freshman year coming back to high school after I graduated college. So it took me eight years to gain 15 pounds from – anyway, um, that's embarrassing. So many people believe that students gain weight – mad gains, you know, uh, as freshmen. So suppose we plan to conduct a study to see if this is true. So describe a study design that require matched pairs T procedure to analyze results. All right. Then the next question, we'll just skip ahead. Decide, describe a study design that would require a two sample T procedure to analyze results. So the difference is one of them is matched paired data and the other is two random event samples going on here. So why are we able to match them together? We would prefer to match them, but when are we not able to match them together? So we can match them if we're using like before and after. So we match the weights of incoming freshmen with the weights of the same freshmen, each one of them matched up together after their freshman year. So that would be it. Um, and that should make sense. So randomly select 100 students, record their weight at the beginning of the year, and then again at the end of the year. Then we can find the average weight gain or loss or for the average difference in their weights from their freshman year through um, the end of their freshman year. Describe, and that would be ideal, right? If we're going to do a sample of before and after, now we'd have to wait a year to be able to do this. And that's probably why they wouldn't do it. But if we could wait a year, we'd be able to remove all the variation from just general weights. So if you start with a heavier freshman and you end with a heavier freshman, right? So a 200 pound freshman. Uh, to a 205 pound at the end, we can remove that and it's just a five pound difference, right? But if we were to treating them as two random samples and we had them just a bunch of freshmen anywhere from like 140 pounds to like 250 pounds or something like that, or a 300 pound lineman, I don't know, that variation that we have from the, from the, um, from the two independent samples, if we don't match them up, it's going to make it almost impossible, even with such a large sample size, to be able to detect what the actual true difference between those uh, between the freshman weights and at the end of their freshman year. All right. So anyway, we want to pair them up. It just takes a year. That's the downside. Describe a study that we would have to use two uh, sample T procedures. So they're independent. They're not paired together. So that would be if we took a hundred freshmen and a hundred sophomores that are not related. They're from two different classes, right? And we just want to see what's the difference uh, real quick, um, not having to wait a year between freshmen and sophomores weights. But again, you're going to have a lot more variability because if you, if you sample one 350 pound lineman, that's going to increase. If it was a freshman, that could throw everything off, right? You could see that freshmen were heavier than sophomores coming in just because of that variation from the sample of one, uh, one person, that outlier. All right, so randomly select 100 students at, and record weight at the beginning of the year, then randomly select another 100 students again at the end of the year. Or you could do the same thing by just selecting sophomores, right? Then you wouldn't have to wait a year. But hey, either way, because they're not the same person, they're not related in any way, we can't match them up or pair them together or anything like that, then this is the best that we can do. All right, uh, 36, I guess we'll do this one as well. This is the last one. So the Cornell professor of nutrition, David Levitsky, designed a match pair study. He recruited 68 students from two large sections of an introductory health course. Although they were volunteers, they appeared to match the rest of the freshman class in terms of demographic variables such as sex and ethnicity. Uh, so he's saying he believes that even though it was a convenient sample, it was his students, he believes they're representative of the overall population at Cornell uh, because they matched uh, demographic variables such as sex and ethnicity. The students were weighed during the first week of the semester, then again 12 weeks later. I copied his data in his Excel spreadsheet so you wouldn't have to put all, all 136 data into your calculator. That's not going to happen. Uh, you're welcome, and uh, found the following summary statistics. So instead of putting in the data, you can just use the summary statistics. It gets you the same answers. Uh, I use Excel, just copy and paste it into Excel, did some formatting and stuff like that, so it was no big deal for me. 
Based on the summer statistics of Professor Levitsky's data, created a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean weight gain in first semester freshmen on the comment that the freshman 15 and common with freshman 15. So weights are in pounds. So I actually looked this guy up, uh, <laughs> which is kind of creepy. And that's what he looks like. So that's not a random photo from Google. That's actually uh, the Cornell professor of nutrition, David Levitsky. All right, so here's his data. Uh, so you can see the subject number one through 68 and then their initial and their terminal weight. So if he's following the same subject for the before and after, this person actually lost weight, uh, gained one pound, you get what's going on here, then this is match pair data. So we actually want to subtract the differences between the two, which is what I gave you in the summary statistics, okay? So here are the summary stats. The average difference that we found would be a positive 1.9 pounds. So on average, they grew uh, 1.9 pounds with a standard deviation 2.1. So to find the sa uh, sampling distribution, uh, sorry, the standard error for the sta for the sampling distribution model, we take the standard deviation from our sample divided by the square root of n, and then that gives us the 2.58. So I'm going to put this in the calculator. It was matched paired, so whenever I'm finding, we wanted a confidence interval, right? What did they ask for? And 95% confidence. Okay. So let's create a confidence interval using this uh, summary stats. Let me move this one down here so I can actually read it. All right, so we went to stat test. We're going to do a t-test because there's not two samples because it's paired. We're going to put in the stats. It's going to save us a lot of time. We're hypothesizing that the difference is delta naught and zero. The average difference we saw was 1.912 uh, with a standard deviation of 2.128. Uh, sample, uh, sample size of 68. We're going to hypothesize um, that it's grown. So what's the probability it's grown? Oh, man. Okay, happens to the best of us. All right, so we're going to say that it's a positive difference. So it's greater than zero. Calculate, boom. All right, so T score was seven standard deviations above the mean for the sample distribution model. If it was centered at zero, the p value is very, very small. Notice the e to the negative 10. So there are nine zeros in front of that one right there. So uh, it's practically zero. Um, the average we found, of course, that came from our our sample, so we're good to go. So is it statistically significant? Oh, I ran a test. Yes, it is statistically significant, but uh, is it 15 pounds? I know the suspense is killing you. Alrighty. I shouldn't have to put it in again. Yeah, same stuff. We wanted 90% confidence. 95 let me check. Mm -hmm. 95%. Okay. All right. And then we hit calculate. Boom. All right. So we believe, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. All right. So uh, comment on the freshman 15. So yes, zero is not contained in our confidence interval. So with a alpha level of two and a half, we're, we're confident that uh, we would have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. But is it practically significant so statistically significant yes practically significant absolutely not so if you gained uh, if we believe that the average at, at cornell university all that stuff during that time or whatever um, we believe that the average weight gain for freshmen was anywhere between 1.4 and 2.4 pounds is that practically significant i say no um, is is 15 contained in that confidence interval could the freshman 15 be true um no not based on on our confidence interval now our confidence interval could be wrong but the probability that it was that far off uh no the p-value is way too small so um we actually could do hypothesized difference of 15. that's actually pretty easy to do why didn't we do that in the first place all right so if our delta naught we're going to assume is a 15 which is rare it's usually we use zero but what's the probability that we got a sample size like this if it was that which we would say what's the probability uh, it's not equal to 15 or that's okay greater than 15 or 15 or greater okay yeah so p-value for that is one <laughs> all right so they're very certain because we would be negative uh 50 uh negative 50 standard deviations below the mean so they are very very confident that is, that that is uh the true mean is actually greater than 15 which is interesting okay so good to go 
that's it all right so right under 40 minutes like a boss awesome so hey that was it just let it soak in there's no more new material for staffs so we're just reviewing at this point this feels good i'm not gonna lie i like this feeling i still gotta make all the review stuff for you but we've done it so congratulations you made it um seniors you're graduating in three weeks so it's been real yeah i just yeah i just uh thudded my chest for you but it was a hollow sound like a like tapping on a hollow log anyway i didn't get those mad gains the 15 year 15 pounds took me like eight years to get that but um anyway so yeah it's been real i've enjoyed this well i'll keep uploading stuff for review for you guys um which is just if you're taking the ap test you should probably work on the review because we won't have a, a final or anything like that so if you're in the on level class you don't really need to do that uh, just work on doing these assignments because a lot of you guys are behind in the first place. So, um, yeah, that's it. I'll, I'll see you guys in the next video. We'll start reviewing, I suppose, unit one.